Welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I am going to do a true crime case and this is actually the first time I'm doing this. I have done true crime cases before but it has been when I'm sitting down and getting ready. So while applying my makeup, I have done a bunch of different cases and I'll link all of those down below. Today is the first time I already have my makeup done and that is because of the fact that Last week we talked about the sad story about the family Sorabi living in Sweden. I had done basically most of my makeup so I only did a parts of it and I felt like the story got told in a much better way from me when I didn't focus on blending out eyeshadow and so on. So today I just wanted to do something different. Hope you are going to appreciate it. Last week as I said we talked about the family Sorabi and it could be discussed if it was an honor killing or not all opinions are okay so if you think that it was or wasn't that's totally up to you but today i am going to talk about an honor killing and i didn't want to be like too repetitive but the thing is that i listened to a podcast and i was trying to figure out which episode i wanted to listen to and then i saw this and i was like oh, i remember this case so I really wanted to do the research on it because I wanted to know everything for myself. So why not just do a video on it? And that is what I'm doing today. So this is the honor killing of Abbas Resai. Per usual, I'm only covering true crime cases that's been happening in Sweden because I live in Sweden and most of you guys haven't heard about them. So today we're starting off in a place called Småland. You'll see it on the map right here. So the last name of the family that we're gonna focus on in this part of the video is Atai. I'll have it on the screen because I'm probably butchering it. And yes, you guessed it, they are from Afghanistan. And if you didn't see my last video, I talked a little bit about how some women, most women actually are uh, treated in Afghanistan. And I'm not gonna be too repetitive, but I'm just gonna mention some parts in case you kind of forgot or you just didn't watch that video. So a lot of the women are not allowed to leave their home if they are not escorted by a man. Great. Another thing is that a lot of 7 to 12 year old girls get married to older men. So imagine yourself being the 7 year old you and being told by your mother or father that this older man this 50, 60 year old man is now going to be your husband. You are going to serve him, you are going to sleep with him, and you are going to bear his children. Yeah, women are treated in a very bad way. A lot of them are being assaulted and raped by their own husbands. And a lot of the older women that has been interviewed have said that their only joy in life is food and 80% of all of the suicide that commits in Afghanistan is by women, which in my personal opinion says a lot. In this video as well, I'm going to put in a little disclaimer. This doesn't mean that this applies to every woman living in Afghanistan. I'm not saying that every man beats their wife or a daughter or whatever it is. I'm just saying that this is how most women live their life. Not everyone, but most women. So now that we have talked about that, let's get back to the family Atai. So the family consisted of the father Rauf, the mother Sarabi, their oldest son Hamed, their daughter Selma, and then they had another son that was youngest. I do believe they might have had another child. I think they actually had a younger child, but that information has been very hard to uh, get a hold of. They lived in two separate apartments. So if you think about it, they lived on like the third floor or something or the second floor. Imagine that there is two apartments in one floor. They had both of the apartments, so they were next to each other, but it wasn't like the same apartment, but they had the entire floor for themselves. Their daughter Selma had a bunch of different rules that wasn't fair in my personal opinion. For instance, when she was in school, she wasn't allowed to speak to men. She wasn't allowed to speak to boys that she didn't know of. She wasn't allowed to speak to anyone that she didn't know. And if she did, her brothers were there the entire time to keep track of her and to see that she did everything correctly and that she didn't speak to someone that she wasn't allowed to speak to and so on. And if she did speak to someone that she wasn't allowed to or did something else that she wasn't allowed to, 
the brothers had the family's permission to punish her. And if they didn't, they themselves would get punished. She didn't like her veil that she had that covered her hair. She didn't want to wear it, but she had to. She wanted to cut her hair, but she wasn't allowed to. Her hair was down to her knees. She wasn't allowed to sit on the computer by herself and she wasn't allowed to watch television. The family did own a television, but she wasn't allowed to watch it. So when the rest of the family wanted to watch television, she had to leave the room. She was also not allowed to have a cell phone. And there were just a bunch of different rules that in my personal opinion is so fucked up and it's so unfair and I'm getting a little bit um, frustrated when talking about it. So I'm sorry that my background changed a little bit. Sigge is per usual whining when I'm filming, so he's right up there where he wants to be because he wants to be in focus, but you can't really see his face. Doesn't matter, let's move on. So as I said, the family Ate was from Afghanistan, but they hadn't lived in Afghanistan. The mother and father had, but not the children. They knew another family from Afghanistan, but they also lived in Sweden and they lived in a place called Skellefteå. I'll show it on the screen right now just so you can see, but it's around like 10 hours apart if you drive. So it's not very, very near. The family from Skellefteå came down to visit the family Ate. They had a daughter and let's just call her Julie. Julie and Selma was talking to each other and they were sitting by the computer. And then Julie shows Selma something on the computer called MSN. It was very, very popular back in the days where you could sit down and you could chat with people, see if they were online. Um, it's not available anymore, but it used to be. And she was showing Selma how this platform worked. And then Selma saw a guy that Julie was friend with on this MSN or Messenger and she was like, ooh, who's that fine boy? She thought he was so beautiful, he was so attractive and a lot of people actually thought that this guy was very attractive. His name was Abbas and he was also living in Khelefthiu and she said that to her like this is a guy he's called Abbas yada 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 x y and c she helped Selma fill up an account on MSN so when the family left the girls continued talking on this platform and they were chatting to each other and eventually Julie was actually sitting with Abbas and he was sitting there to kind of translate Swedish I don't know which of them had a problem with the Swedish language but one of them had anyway so one of them was kind of translating and eventually um, Abbas and Selma started to talk with each other on MSN but on Julie's account and then eventually they swapped information so that they could add each other on MSN and keep talking there in private which they did so let's talk a little bit about who Abbas was Abbas was a guy, he was 19 years old, and before anyone gets uh, mad or anything, in Sweden it's allowed to have sex when you're 15 years old, so this wasn't anything strange, 19 and 16 is not something that is strange or it's very very common here in Sweden anyway so I just wanted to point that out I'm not saying that they ever had sex I don't even know if they did but I'm just saying that so that no one flips out in the comment because in these videos it's very important to be extra extra clear so that nothing gets misinterpreted. Abbas had only been in Sweden for about a year. He was actually living in Afghanistan before this, but his father and his oldest brother got killed in the war. So his family actually had to flee the country and they fled to Iran. When they were in Iran, they got some money and then they sent Abbas to live in Sweden. So the family was hoping that Abbas would be successful in Sweden so eventually they could come here and live with him. Eventually Abbas met a guy here in Sweden that he got very close to and they became best friends and this guy is called Elias. Elias was also from Afghanistan and he and Abbas was kind of from the same neighborhood. They knew ab about like the same different people and in an interview with Elias he said that in their culture if the father has died, the oldest brother kind of has to act 
like a father for the rest of the family. He has to keep appearance. He has to keep faith because if he doesn't have any faith, the family, the rest of the family won't have any faith either. So a lot of heavy stuff on Abbas that was only 19 years old. He came to Sweden on his own, like after his father and oldest brother was killed. Now he had to flee the country. And then when he was living in Iran, he had to leave his the rest of his family to come to Sweden where he had never been. He didn't know the country. He didn't know the language. He didn't understand like anything. And imagine yourself coming to a country like that being all alone it has to be i i just cannot imagine how tough and how hard it must have been for him and then also the fact that he kind of has to be the father of his family and he has to like keep strong for for them it has to be so hard um in sweden anyway he was trying to learn Swedish and he was doing a good job. Um, he was very, very driven, maybe because of the fact that his family rested on him. But then also, um, he was very childish. He was described as a very childish man. And I'm saying that in the most respectful way as I can. No one was like saying that and being offensive when he said it. It was kind of like he loved to play ping pong. He loved to play soccer. He was like, the guys was kind of um, wrestling with each other. Most of the people said that the guys that came to Sweden was very childish. They were still very, very playful and they like to have a lot of fun. Abbas and Elias, they got an apartment together and they lived there, just the two of them, and it, they got along very well. Elias actually said that he knew Abbas more than Abbas knew himself, and then vice versa. Abbas and Selma, as I said, they started to have this contact, but they only were in contact in school because as I said, Selma wasn't allowed to sit by the computer by herself. So when she was in school, she could do it when they got a computer to use in class or something like that, uh, or in the library where they usually had computers back then. And eventually they fell in love. They hadn't even met each other, but they knew that they wanted to be with each other. And Abbas actually sent Selma a necklace. So it was a heart that was in two so he had one piece and then she could have the other heart and it was you know cute like when i read that oh it was so cute i think that it's so adorable it actually was so serious that they had talked about marriage that kind of says a lot they were pretty serious with each other selma kept this relationship a secret she never told anyone that she was in a relationship with abbas and yes they were in a relationship even though that they hadn't met but she knew that she wanted to be with him but she never told anyone and this is because she knew that her family wouldn't agree she was already engaged to one of her cousins living in denmark this was not a decision that she had made for herself but a decision that her family had made for her specifically her mother and father obviously and um, the danish cousin had came to Sweden uh, with his uncle to ask for her hand. So the mother and father actually accepted if under the condition that he could give them $35,000, but then also three sets of gold jewelries. They agreed and they returned home, I'm assuming to gather up all of the money and the jewelries and stuff like that. And this is, this is why she never told them and one day she's actually inside one of the apartments and no one else is there but the door is open she i don't know if they used to have the doors open because they have the entire floor i'm not too sure about it but the front door was open that's what i'm talking about and she was sitting and she was talking to abbas and she doesn't hear that her brother and her father is walking up the stairs. She's speaking kind of loudly and then she sees her father coming inside the room that she's sitting in. So the father asks her who she's speaking to and if it's a guy. She says, no, it's not a guy. And he actually calls her out on this and he gets so mad because he knows that it is a guy that she's speaking to, probably because of the content that what they were talking about. 
Um, but anyway, he gets so mad that he drags her to the bathroom and then he screams for um, her brother, Hamed, and he screams to him to get a knife. He runs into the kitchen, he grabs a knife, he comes back into the bathroom and he says, do it. The brother actually says that he couldn't do it. So Selma actually got safe out of the bathroom. But the big issue here is that Rauf, the father wanted to kill her. And the reason he wanted to kill her is because of the fact that he didn't want her to drag shame onto his family, which is just insane. He didn't want her to be in a relationship with a guy that she loved. I, I just, I, I don't know what to say. I'm sorry. I don't know what to say. This is just fucked up. Now Selma is very, very scared because she never knows when the Danish guy is going to come and pick her up. But then also she's fearing for her life. So she writes to Abbas and she says that he has to come and pick her up. So they arrange for him to take the plane from his place to her place. And then they would meet at her place. And then they would together take the flight to his place and then they would start a new life there. He tells her to kind of delete all of their messages, change her passwords and everything so that they never knew where she went. She goes to school a Thursday as planned and then she just disappears. So obviously we know that she didn't disappear because we know that she went and met up with Abbas and then they actually started their new life together. When she came to Khaleftiu, she cut her hair. So I'll show you a little picture right here on the screen right now. Um, her face is blurred out and we'll get more into that later, but she didn't cut it like, you know, short. She still has a very, very long hair, but she did have hair down to her knees. So she kind of wanted to cut it and she didn't have her veil on her because she, as I said, didn't like it. Now, I'm not sure if she never had a veil when she was there or when she just didn't have a veil when she was inside their apartment but they did have pretty thick curtains so that no one could look into their apartment. So it was only Abbas and Elias that saw her without a veil that I know of anyway. People who knew Abbas said that they never let go of each other's hand. They were walking hand in hand all over. Abbas stopped playing soccer. He was kind of a little bit more grown up now and I'm assuming that this is because of her and I'm again saying this in the most respectful way as I can. You guys know how it is when you are new in love and he was the guy that was kind of going to take care of her. So of course he wanted to act like a grown up and be a little bit more adult now. They were living their fairytale life, but as you can imagine, Selma's family wasn't I want to say that they were worried, but they actually weren't. They were kind of getting a little bit more and more upset by the minute. <laughs> First and foremost, they thought that maybe it was the Danish guy that came and took her because maybe he couldn't wait anymore, but they finally realized, okay, he had nothing to do with it. And somehow this Danish cousin figured out that she had talked to a guy in Huileftiu. I don't know how he actually realized this, but it really doesn't matter. So what happens is that Sagar, which is S Selma's mother, she starts calling people in Huileftiu that is from Afghanistan. So I don't know how, but eventually they realized that Selma is somewhere in Hueleftiu. So Sagar and Hamed drives from Småland to Hueleftiu. This is a 10 hour drive. So I know that all of this is gonna be a little bit messy, but just stay with me. Sagar and Hamed, which is the mother and the oldest brother of Selma, takes the car, drives the 10 hour drive to Hueleftiu, somewhere there, they walk into someone's home. There is a bunch of guys living there that's from Afghanistan. They look for Selma, she's not there. Then they leave. Abbas is at home. He gets a call from one of the guys in this place and they say, watch out, Sagar is coming. So what he does is that he takes Selma and he hides her in the laundry room and then he starts cleaning the apartment. He tries to take away all of the female clothes and every evidence that Selma has been there. Elias comes home doesn't really know what Abbas is doing and he fills Elias in on the situation. 
Then they see a woman, she doesn't knock, she doesn't ring the doorbell, she just walks inside, she walks straight up to Elias, takes her hand, puts it into his pocket, takes out his phone without asking or saying a word to him, and then trying to go through his phone. And he's like, what are you doing? And she tries to see if he has Selma's phone number there, which she doesn't, which is a fortune. But then she walks into the kitchen and she sees that someone has been cooking. It is a stew that her daughter usually did at home. So she knows that, okay, I'm in the right place. And she starts screaming like, where's my daughter? Give my daughter to her. And Elias gets really, really mad because he's like, you need to get the fuck out of my apartment. You're not welcome, get the fuck out. She tries to take the pot with the stew in it because she says that she's going to take the fingerprints and she's gonna prove that her daughter has been there. Eventually, they cannot get this woman out of the apartment, so they have to call the police. The police has to remove her from the apartment because she has no right being there. Eventually, the mother and the brother has to go home. They cannot find their daughter, but what they do is that they call Abbas and they are starting to threaten him. They are saying that the uncle from Denmark is on his way and he is going to... Um, take care of this situation. They, they call everyone that they know. So every person that's from Afghanistan that they know in Khuleftu, they call and try to say like, you know, keep an eye on these people. They are trying to make their life a living hell and they succeed because these people were so scared that they never wanted to go out when, when it was light out. They never wanted to go out during the daytime because they were scared for their lives. So another piece of information comes from Elias that I'm going to tell you guys right now. Um, this is something that I never knew about and this says a little bit about the culture of uh, people living in Afghanistan because he describes it as like their relationship was doomed from the beginning because they were from different types of families. Abbas was from a community that's called Hassar. Hassar was hated by the Taliban. Um, they were stalked by the Taliban, but then also they had a history of being slaves. Selma's family, on the other hand, was called Seyed, and they had a high religious status. They said that they were uh, related to the Prophet Muhammad, and they demanded respect. If you saw them outside, you had to kiss their hand, and again, as I said, they, they demanded a lot of respect. So this, these two were from different communities and they could, couldn't be. And this is also going to be a little bit confusing, but if a family, let's just say family Hassar and then family Syed. The family Hassar has a beautiful daughter, then Syed can come to them and want their son to marry a Hassar and that's okay. They cannot, the Hassars, cannot decline, they have to agree. However, a man from a family Hassar can never marry a daughter from a Sayed family. Abbas was a man, he was Hassar. Selma was a girl, she was Sayed. This could never have happened, according to him. So I wanted this to be in the video because I felt like this is important information, in my personal opinion anyway, and it kind of makes you understand a little bit more of why they couldn't be. So back to the timeline. Selma and Abbas stayed in the apartment for about a week. They didn't know what to do and eventually they turned to social service that was asses and said that, why can't Selma just go home? They tried to explain that they feared for their life. I mean, the father had attempted to kill her, but just with Hamid's help. I just, oh, that got me so freaking upset. So after this, they still don't know what to do. So they end up going to one of Abba's friends and they borrow her phone and they call Sagar. Selma is the one who dials and who calls and talks to Sagar, which is her mother. Her mother gets so, so happy when she hears that it's Selma calling and she says that she has made Rauf, Selma's father, change his mind. He is now okay with the fact that they are getting married. He's okay with them being engaged. He has 
uh, changed his mind or Sagar has made him change his mind. They want them to come home. They want to have a party for them. They want to have an engagement party for them. They said that they would buy gifts and they would make a bunch of delicious food and then they would get married and they would start their own life and they wanted to be a part of their life. So they just begged them to come home. Selma was like, oh, are you serious? Is this actually true? And she said, yes, it's true. Like, please come home. And they decided that, okay, we're coming home. So the day before they left, they had a little engagement party of their own. They invited some of their friends. They ate some pizza and some cake. They had a lot of music. They had still thick curtains that covered all of the windows so that no one could look in on them but still they had a nice time and the day after they would leave to go to Småland. Abbas was a little bit scared but Selma said no it's going to be fine because they had some people on the social service thingy that was going to go with them so the social services was going to meet up with Sagar and then they would meet up with Abbas and Selma and they would together go to um, Sagar's home or Selma's home where they lived. So they met up with the social service guys after the plane ride and also Sagar. They got into the same car and then they headed to the apartments. When they came to the apartments they realized that Rauf, Selma's father, wasn't in the best mood and the social service guy told them like no arguments now. They told the brother as well like no arguments, no huss, no fuss, keep it clean, keep it good, which they all agreed on and then he left. So the one that left was the social service guy. So just to remind you guys, the family had the entire floor and two apartments on this floor. So they wanted Selma to go into one apartment and they wanted Abbas to go into one apartment. This is sort of tradition when you have an engagement and then also the mother and father wanted to speak to Selma alone first and then they would go in and speak to Abbas. So they go in, they talk to Selma and uh, then they go to speak to Abbas. So now the mother is still with Selma in one apartment, the father is with Abbas, and the brother Hamid is also there. Then the father gets a little bit of tummy ache, so he goes to the bathroom because he needs to poop, and he hears a lot of commotion. So he goes out of the bathroom to see what all of the commotion is about, and he can see Hamid stabbing Abbas to death. He tries to get in between, but he has no chance. His brother is going like a maniac on Abbas. He's just stabbing and stabbing and stabbing. And he knew that like, I cannot get involved here. I cannot because he's gonna kill me as well. So when Hamid has calmed himself down, the mother comes into the apartment as well and asks like, what have you done? And is he dead? They say, yes, he's dead. They don't know what to do, so they actually flee the scene. They clean up the apartment. So the family flees to Denmark, where they stay for four days before they go back to Sweden. And they actually go to the police, and Hamid turns himself in. The police arrests the entire family, and they take the two youngest children. So the two children that I haven't mentioned by name in this video, they take them into like foster homes and shit like that but they arrest Selma, Hamid, Sagar, and Rauf. They arrest all of them. The police had already found Abbas' body. You see, Abbas had said to Elias that if I haven't called you or answered the phone in three days, you have to call the police, which they did. The police goes to the apartment. One of the apartment is fine, there's nothing wrong with it, but in the other apartment, as you guys already know, Abbas was dead. I know I haven't talked a lot about like how many times he got stabbed and everything, but I will get into that a little bit more later on. But for now, it's just gonna be a little bit up in the air. As I said, the police had arrested four of them, but they very, very quickly let go of Selma. Selma was actually taken into like a witness protection program. I don't think they changed everything about her, you know, like her social security number and everything, but um, they did fear for her life. So they moved her to an unknown location 
and this is why her face has been blurred out of this picture. The police wasn't really sure if it was only Hamid that had committed the murders because Selma's parents was against the relationship from the beginning and then also Rauf had tried to kill Selma because he didn't want her to bring shame to the family. So they actually prosecuted all three of them. So again, Hamid, Sagar, and then Rauf. The court only sentenced Hamid. Hamid said that the reason why he wanted to kill Abbas was because of the fact that he had stolen his sister. He couldn't show his face in school anymore, so he hated Abbas. He said that he had brought shame onto the family and he just wanted him dead. But he actually said that the reason why he killed him or why he pulled a knife is because of the fact that it was in self-defense. More details than this, I don't actually know. So Hamid was actually sentenced to four years in juvenile and then after that he was going to be deported. Hamid was scared to go to Afghanistan because he had never lived there but also because he knew that Abbas relatives would take out their revenge on him. This is usually around the time where I end the video but we're not done. There's a lot more twists and turns to this story. So just sit back down. <laughs> Abbas family wasn't happy about the fact that only Hamid was sentenced to the murder. So they appealed and it went to um, the courts of appeal where they kind of said the same thing as the first sentence. But then after four years, when it was time to deport him, he said, I haven't done anything. I'm going to confess everything that happened the day that Abbas was murdered. So the Supreme Court stopped him from being deported. They put it on ice. And now I'm going to tell you what actually happened on November 16th, 2005, the day that Abbas was murdered. So on November 16th, 2005, the day where they were going to be celebrated, their love was going to be celebrated, Selma and Abbas expected to come to a house that was filled with gifts, good food, and like, you know, a very nice environment, but that was not the case. The family hadn't bought any gifts and they haven't cooked any food. But what they had bought was, um, you know, dog crackers because in their eyes, they weren't more worthy than dogs. And just a little side note here, but you know, my dog, he's worth everything to me. But in their culture, from my understanding, is that it's not something very nice to be called a dog. I'm not saying that everyone that comes from Afghanistan hates dogs, but it's kind of a slur. It's not something very nice to be said about someone. And Rauf actually a lot of the time spoke about Selma like a dog. He was kind of condescending. As I said before, when Abbas and Selma arrives to the apartment, Selma goes into one apartment and then Abbas goes into one apartment. When Selma is sitting in one apartment, um, her mother is making some lemonade or some orange juice that she serves to Selma and Rauf. Selma doesn't really want this juice, but she drinks it. She doesn't realize that she was drugged. So she gets very, very dizzy, probably like right after and she goes to lie down on a bed and she falls asleep. The family wakes her up many hours later when Abbas is already dead. Now, Rauf is going into the apartment where Abbas is and he says that he made a mistake coming to Småland. He made a mistake talking to their daughter uh, and that he could kill him if he wanted to. Now, Sagar also comes into this apartment and she's holding a pot. Abbas stands up and Sagar throws the liquid that is in the pot on Abbas and he holds up his arms like this, but he still gets hit. This is oil that they have boiled. So this is like burning hot oil. I cannot imagine the pain. Abbas tries to run to the door. Rauf is screaming, don't let him get out of the apartment. Sagar runs after him and grabs him and she drags him back inside the apartment. Rauf takes up a baseball bat and he tr starts beating him. He beats him so hard that the baseball bat actually breaks. Then he takes up a crowbar and he continues to hit him with this. 
Then Rauf screams to Hamid to grab a knife. Hamid doesn't know which knife he's talking about, so Rauf tells him which knife it is. Hamid grabs this knife and he goes to his father that screams that he should kill Abbas. He screams like, just do it. He just stands there and he says, I can't. Rauf then takes the knife and he starts stabbing Abbas. So it is believed that Abbas was hit with the oil once again while he was still alive. It is believed that the mother tried to bend up his mouth and then someone tried to pour this burning oil into his throat. <sighs> That's not all, we're not done. He was also sculpted. I do believe that that is the correct translation. It's basically, and I'm so sorry for saying this, but it's basically where you cut and take away a piece of the skull right here. You can go ahead and watch pictures online. It's not gruesome pictures. If you look at Wikipedia, for instance, you can see that some people have been sculpted back in the days. It's basically just that you remove a piece of the skull and hair will never grow there again. This is a gruesome, gruesome murder. And when researching this case, I have had to stop many, many times because not only is it so fucking insane, but it's such a mean torture. I have no words for it. It just makes me so fucking angry when reading about this. So anyway, let's fast forward. They flee the scene, they clean up, and then they go to Denmark, and they meet up with their relatives, and they stay with them for a couple of days. They tell the Danish relatives what have happened and what they have done, and they actually tell them that you should blame this on Hamid, because sentencings in Denmark and in Sweden are pretty similar and they said that in other trials that had been in Denmark people had gotten away and gotten a less of a sentence because they had been young so they said that you should blame this on Hamid he should take full responsibility so that is what they did the problem with this is that the police never believed them you see, there were a lot of things that didn't add up to them and they knew that Hamid hadn't acted alone if he was a part of this. They saw on the mother that she had burn marks on her hand and when they asked her about this, she said that, oh no, I just burned myself while cooking. Mm, yeah, right, bitch, no fucking way. There were a lot of other things that just didn't really add up. Remember the knife that I said that Rauf asked Hamid to grab? That knife was cleaned down, but then it was sort of like they had taken Hamid's fingerprints. They had pressed his fingers into the blood and then just pressed on two bloody fingerprints on it, which is very unnatural. It's not like it usually happens, like in a dry-ish blood and then just pressed on. And there were a lot of other evidence, but the reason why the court and then also the court of appeal never could convict the mother and father was because of the fact that they knew that someone else had helped him in, but they could not determine who it was. They didn't know if it was the parents because there were a lot of other footprints in this apartment that they couldn't attach to, to them. These were unknown footprints, so it is believed that the family actually had other relatives that were there and helped them. Neighbors to the family had said that they saw two Danish cars there. Yeah, I think. It could be that the Danish people actually helped them as well. But again, the court of appeal and then the normal court could never state that yes, it is certain that it was the mother and father. I'm going to remind you that in Sweden, we don't have juries, we have judges and they work uh, only by evidence and they would rather free someone than convict an innocent person. So let's just talk a little bit about the new sentencing that happened for all of these people. Hamid was freed. The court actually said that they felt like he had served all of the years that he needed. He served four years and he was not going to be deported anymore. So he is now living 
under witness protection as well. Hamid is not his real name. This is also a pseudonym. Selma is still living under uh, witness protection. I don't know where and I don't want to know. Um, and this is obviously not her real name either. Rauf and Sagar, this is their real names. They got sentenced to 10 years each. They actually wanted to sentence them to more years, but they also said that they wanted to deport them when they had served 10 years here. Rauf and Sagar still says that they are innocent and they blame everything on Abbas. They say that it's Abbas fault that he got murdered. They say that it's Abbas fault that he uh, ruined their family. And they said that they don't feel bad for him at all. Um, which just proves to me that they are horrible people and uh, they are disgusting. I have never felt so bad when researching a case that I did when I researched this case. To start boiling up oil and then throw it on someone and then trying to pour it down someone's throat is disgusting. Being sculpted is disgusting. Just the fact what they did to this guy is disgusting. Their entire attitude is disgusting. I don't understand how people can be this vicious. I'm so, so sorry if this case got very all over the place. Let me know and I will do a little bit of a better job next time. I thought that maybe it could be a little bit interesting not to reveal that the parents was in on it in the beginning of the video as well, but hey, you live, you learn. And I try to do these videos so they are a little bit exciting for you guys as well. And that when there are plot twists, I'll put them in there. <laughs> I would really like it if you would like this video or dislike it, depending on if you thought that it was a good video or a bad video. If you want to, please subscribe. I'm doing a lot more makeup and murder videos or just murder videos in general. So yeah, I think I'm gonna have a missing case up next, but I'm not too sure. We'll see. That's all for me. Bye.